if we start with a sample of radioactive atoms in a time interval delta t some of them some of them will undergo radioactive decay let's say that the number of atoms that do undergo decay is delta n so the remaining atoms are n minus delta n here we can write the rate of this decay that will be the number of the number of atoms that decayed that is delta n per unit time so the rate of decay becomes delta n by delta t in this video we will talk about what this rate of decay depends upon and also how we know if the rate is fast or slow to begin with we can say that the number of radioactive nuclei they are decreasing with time we started with n and now we have n minus delta n so delta n here the final final nf minus ni final number of remaining nuclei minus initial number of nuclei that will be a negative number since we have less active radioactive nuclei after time delta t so the rate of decay is a negative quantity and therefore we add a minus sign before it and turns out that this rate of decay it is directly proportional to the number of the number of radioactive nuclei let's let's try and get some intuition of this let's say here you have here you have a, a group of let's say a group of 10000 10000 carbon 14 radioactive atoms of carbon 14 and in a different group we have let's say we have 100 100 radioactive carbon 14 atoms so the same radioactive isotope of carbon but we have different n we have we have 10000 here and we have 100 over here and after some time let's say after 1 second after 1 second it's possible that it's possible that 100 carbon atoms over here they decay they undergo a radioactive decay you wouldn't really see that with carbon 14 these are just random at completely random numbers or let's assume them just for the sake of our intuition so in one second 100 carbon atoms undergo decay from from the from the first group and here here we have 100th of the number of carbon atoms in this sample as this one we have only 100 carbon 14 atoms over here and over here we have 10000 so here we have 100th of the carbon 14 atoms compared to this one so for every 100 atoms we saw decaying here we will really expect to see one carbon atom one carbon atom undergoing a decay from this group one carbon atoms decay per second just because we have a smaller amount so so if you think about delta n by delta t delta n by delta t is much less for this sample only one here delta n is just one only one carbon atom underwent decay in one second but over here 100 underwent decay in one second and we can also see this if we have some data on on half-life of any any random sample let's say we have some some random sample x and if we start with 100 radioactive nuclei of that of that random sample after after one half-life only 50 will remain and after one more half-life 25 will remain and after one more half-life around 12 12 will remain so we see that in the same interval of one half-life in the same delta t of one half-life initially when we had 100 radioactive nuclei 50 of them decayed and then when we had 50 nuclei remaining only 25 decayed and then we had and then when we had 25 only 13 decayed so delta n is decreasing delta n by delta t is decreasing as the number of remaining radioactive nuclei that is n as that number decreases so the rate of decay delta n by delta t it is it is proportional to the number of radioactive nuclei that is n and when we remove this proportionality we get a constant which is called the decay constant this right here is called the decay the decay constant and this is denoted by lambda this constant is specific for a particular nuclei it will have one value for carbon 14 it will have a different value for some other radioactive atom let's say some radioactive isotope of carbon maybe carbon 15 it will have a different value for some radioactive isotope of nitrogen and it has different values for all the different radioactive nucleides but what does that different value tell us so we can take a similar looking example to understand that let's say again we have two groups now now we have instead of carbon 14 let's say we have 10000 uh, we have 10000 some other radioactive isotope we can take anything we can take let's take let's take nitrogen 16 and another group we have 100 100 of the same nitrogen 16 and let's say that the value of lambda is more for nitrogen 16 compared to carbon 14 
So how would that look like? If the value of decay constant is more for n16, it's possible that in one second, in one second, out of 10,000, we have 500 decays, 500 decays per second. And here, because the number is 100th of this, we will have five decays per second. But if we compare this nitrogen 16 to carbon 14, whose, whose decay constant would be less than that of nitrogen, we say that lesser number of decays happen in one second. So what decay constant really tells us is how likely a radioactive atom will undergo decay. What are the chances that a radioactive atom will undergo decay? If the chances of an atom undergoing decay are large, then that decay will happen quicker. So a large value of lambda tells us that there will be a rapid decay. The decay will happen quicker because higher value of lambda tells us the chance or the probability that an atom will undergo a decay is large. In this case, in this case, we see that the probability of one nitrogen 16 atom undergoing decay is much more than the probability that one carbon 14 will undergo decay. And a small value of lambda tells us that decay will be slower. This will be a slower decay. So this right here is a very important equation, which is that the rate of decay that equals lambda into n and the rate of decay, it's called, this is sometimes called as, this is sometimes called as activity, activity of the sample. We can spend some time talking about its units. So one common, one common unit for activity is, I'm, and I'm writing all that over here. One common unit is called Curie, C-U-R-I-E, and it is denoted by capital C small i and this is equal to 3.7 into 10 to the power 10 decays per second decays per second but there is one si unit of activity which is called becquerel this is called becquerel and it is denoted by capital b small q and the relation is that one curie this is equal to 3.7 into 10 to the power 10 becquerels so one becquerel is basically equal to one decay per second these are the units for activity. We can also try and represent activity in the form of a graph. We know that a sample of radioactive atoms, they undergo decay exponentially. So this n varies as e to the power minus lambda t. That is how it, that is how it decays exponentially. So if activity is equal to lambda into something that varies exponentially, activity also varies exponentially. So the same graph that we drew for an exponential decay for any, any sample of radioactive atoms, the same graph holds true for activity as well. We can say that there is some initial activity which re reduces to half A0 by 2 in one half life. And this reduces to A0 by 4 in one more half life. This number can also be verified experimentally. And the instrument that is used to count the number of radioactive decays per second or to measure the activity of a radioactive sample that instrument is called a GM counter or a Geiger-Muller counter. It's a Geiger-Muller counter. This instrument measures the activity of any radioactive sample. So that's why it becomes very important to know the activity of any sample because it can be experimentally verified. You can actually count the number of decays happening per second with the help of this instrument. And it's very interesting how this instrument works. We will not go into the detail of that. But as soon as it detects one radioactive decay, there is a clicking sound or there's a crackling sound which this instrument emits. And one can actually take a note of that. So we saw that the rate of decay, it depends upon the number of radioactive nuclei present and also this decay constant lambda. This decay constant tells us whether a decay would happen rapidly or slowly. Turns out there is one more quantity which can give us some insight into whether a decay will happen rapidly or slowly and that is called a mean life. So let me, let me make some space. Let's say we have this group of radioactive atoms and because radioactive decay, it's a random process really. You can never predict when a radioactive decay will occur. All of these radioactive atoms, even though they must be of the same radioactive isotope, they will undergo decay at different time instants. That could look somewhat like this. Maybe for this much amount of time, nothing happens to the topmost atom and then it immediately decays. And it differs for different atoms. So a mean life is nothing but calculating all of these times. Maybe this is T1, T2, T3, this could be T4, this could be T5. So it's just adding up all of this, dividing by the number of the radioactive atoms present. And there is some integration and calculus involved in this. We will not be going into that. But turns out after doing all of that calculation, you get mean life 
mean life which is denoted by tau this to be equal to 1 by lambda and let's see if this equation makes sense lambda is a decay constant which tells us how likely it is that a radioactive atom will undergo decay so if the value of lambda is high if an atom has a very high chance of undergoing decay then it's true that the mean life of that radioactive nuclei will be very less and if this lambda is less if the rate of decay is very slow then the radioactive nuclei will remain radioactive for a longer period of time and so the mean life also would be more.